Welcome back, everybody. Thanks again for joining us for this session on orienting yourself in the capital. Um, I'm Ann Meeker. Uh, I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives for the Popbox Foundation, and it is my privilege to get kick off this session for us today. So let me start here. So feeling lost in Congress at some point is absolutely a rite of passage. It happens to every single person in whatever capacity they enter Congress. And we don't just mean in the physical building. As former district staffer, this is very important to me. Uh, but we're also orienting yourself in the political space of Congress. So how does Congress work? What can it do? How does my job as an intern fit in? And then the digital space of Congress as well. Where do I find the information I need? How can I get the answer to this urgent question my chief of staff is asking me in the next 10 minutes? Um, all of that can also be challenging. So when that feeling sinks in, because it will, know that you're not alone. All of us have been in your shoes. But also have no fear, for today we are joined by experts in finding your way around all of those different dimensions of Congress. So I would like to welcome Brad Fitch. Brad is a Capitol Hill lifer, starting out as a journalist, chief of staff, and now CEO of the Congressional Management Foundation. If you have not explored CMF yet, I'd like to invite you to check out CMF's incredible resources for interns and future staffers. Brad, over to you. Thanks, Ann. And, and Ann left out one big part about my bio. bio. I started out as an intern on Capitol Hill. And some of you may be wondering why I'm all dressed up like this. Well, this is what I call my Democracy Award outfit. We have a program called the Democracy Awards. I only wear this outfit once a year. We're in Democracy Award season. It's like the Oscars for Congress or the Oscars for ugly people, if you're being uncharitable towards the Congress. But I urge you to go check out the Democracy Awards. You might be working for an award-winning office and don't know it. So it's important to check out whether or not you are. So my job here today is to talk to you about orienting yourself to Capitol Hill. And Kelly, I think in the last session, touched on it, I think, quite perfectly when she talked about what drives members of Congress, motivates them. Because frankly, the picture that you have been painted on in Hollywood and in mainstream media just isn't the right picture. Let me give you some data points that illustrate this. So you probably have a very cynical view of Congress, like many Americans. This survey illustrates it, taken from the Rasmussen Company. Voters were asked, do you agree or disagree with this statement? Most members of Congress care what their constituents think. And unfortunately, only 11% of Americans agree with this statement. Well, why is that? Well, I blame these guys, but then again, I blame Hollywood for a lot of things. This is not a documentary, everybody, okay? They got the decorations in the majority leader's office, right? That's about it. Because when we actually drill down and see what motivates members of Congress, it's actually what you'd want in a public servant. The Congressional Management Foundation took a survey of actual members of the House of Representatives a few years ago and asked them this question right here. Please rate how important each of these job aspects are to your effectiveness as a representative. And nine out of 10, 95%, number one answer said, staying in touch with constituents. As been referenced earlier in the program, most of these people are good, decent, hardworking public servants. Now I'm not saying that we don't get our share of crazies. The American public is very good about electing the occasional CAD criminal, dare I say wiener, yes, it does happen. But most of the people you're gonna be working with are gonna be really decent people. And they care about what their constituents think. Let me give you a data point we got from a survey we did of members of staff working in congressional offices. The question went like this. If your member has not already arrived at a firm decision on an issue, how much influence might the following advocacy strategies directed to the Washington office have on his or her decision? And what we found is that in-person visits from constituents or constituents representatives was really the dominant factor here. Now, let me bring on a special guest star that will illustrate this even further. When I was a college student, one of my favorite programs was This Week on ABC, and my favorite commentator was Cokie Roberts, who was one of my heroines, and I had the opportunity to meet Cokie once. Now, what you may not know about Cokie is that both of her parents were members of Congress. Her father was Hal Box, who got, rose to be majority leader of the House, died tragically in a plane crash, and then her mom, Lindy Box, got her seat and his seat and served for another 17 years. And Cokie was asked about the influence of constituents. Let's listen in to what she answered. One that we're going to talk about because uh, we should say both of your parents were members of Congress. And uh, Catherine Bullington, she wrote this question. What weight do politicians give to phone calls 
and letters. What's the most effective way to influence our Congress people? What do you think? You know, that's actually a, a terrific question. And the answer is that they give tremendous weight to letters and phone calls from people in their districts. If you send blast emails from some sort of organization or postcards or worst of all phone calls, mm -hmm. they are not only not likely to pay attention, but they're likely to get annoyed. Uh, this, <laughs> if, uh, you, if you go into a congressional office and there's some phone bank thing going on, you'll see some poor harassed child sitting at the desk. Uh, <laughs> dealing with all the phone dealing calls. Dealing with all the phone calls. This is welcome to my office. This right, is your first right. job. But if it's somebody who is from the district, uh, and particularly if it's someone who's active in the community in the district, uh, members of Congress pay a tremendous amount of attention to those people. And the truth is, if people from a member's district go to their offices and see that member, it really can make a difference. Hmm. So another thing about Congress that you don't see is that they also work very hard. The average work week for a member of Congress when they're in session is 70 hours a week. And the time that they're spending are the things that they should be spending their time in. When they're in Washington, D.C., the top thing they're working on is legislative activity. When they're back in the district, it is district activity, constituent services. And again, as we referenced earlier and, and, and reference, you can get this data from our website. Now, let me just talk a few minutes about staff because staff are the people you're gonna be working with. I'll just start with a little history lesson. Does anybody know who this is? It's the most famous congressional staffer of all time. And if you look at his application to be a clerk in the House of Representatives in 1931, you can see, yes, Lyndon Johnson started out as a staffer. And just to show you how things haven't changed in over a century, Lyndon Johnson said this about the mail, I thought I was going to be buried. So things haven't changed on Capitol Hill. But let me give you a quick rundown on what it's like to work on Capitol Hill. It's a lot like an emergency room, because in an emergency room, you've got a lot of young people making important decisions, working really long hours, and those decisions affect people's lives. That's what's like in Congress. Here's a quick snapshot of the demographics of just some of the people you'll be working with. And what you'll find is they are really dedicated public servants working hard for the American people. Let's go back to one of the surveys we did of congressional staff and compare attitudes about staff to, in general, the general public. And what we found is they're a lot like first responders when they're asked how important are these aspects to your job. 79% of congressional staff said overall office culture was very important compared to 46% of the American public. Meaningfulness of job, contribution your work has to the goals of the office. All of these are scoring way much higher than your average employee. One staffer summed it up this way. Working in Congress means serving the American people, trying to make a difference in a very complicated and combative process and confusing. And the other thing you need to know, this environment you're going into is very scary and very difficult. Let me just share with you just a couple of quotes and a couple of data points that we captured in a survey just last month. We asked staffers this, which of the following do you personally experience on a daily or near daily basis? And 45% said the anxiety for their own safety and that of their member of Congress. The Inspector General's office has said that death threats have gone up by 100% between January of 2020 and 21, and that's something that we just have to deal with. A significant portion said they get direct or insultant or threatening messages or communications, and they're frustrated at not being able to do as much as they'd like. Some of the comments that they made in this survey uh, go like this. We are working all remotely, and it's starting to consider returning, but there's hesitation and concern. Folks are burnt out. We have experienced a significant increase in angry messages, and we're all doing our best to balance taking care of ourselves with supporting our member and helping our constituents. That really sums up where the Congress is and where they are right now. And that's the environment that you are going into. You're going into a post-January 6th environment. You're going into an environment where you might have to feel death threats. And when we get into the panel, we can talk a little bit about that in more detail. But this is the type of environment that you're gonna be going into. It's an exciting environment. It's a fantastic environment. It's one that I started in in 38 years ago as an intern, and I've spent my entire career affiliated with the United States Congress, and I wouldn't change a minute of it. Thank you so much, Brad. That was extremely informative. Um, like Brad mentioned, please uh, go to the congressionalfoundation.org um, to check out more resources. It's a phenomenal resource uh, for staffers. At this point, I'd like to welcome Venice Smith, IT Systems Analyst in the Legislative Computer Systems 
within the office of the clerk. I'll let Venice tell you more, but the clerk's office and website is an invaluable resource for understanding how Congress works and what's going on at any given moment. Venice, you have the floor. Hi, thank you. Um, Brad, thank you for um, the your information that you were sharing before about constituents, uh, because that kind of ties into some of the passions that drive why I became um, an IT systems analyst. I had a lot of interest in um, providing information to people and making sure that resources were available to uh, members of Congress so that they can provide information to their staff. And that's a lot of the times what you'll see interns are tasked with finding information. Um, so uh, the office of the clerk, one of the, uh, the functions of the clerk is to prepare the role of the members elect um, and maintain the record of legislative debate and certify legislation and, and bills and that sort of thing and conduct, and conduct um, the administrative functions. Um, so with technological advancements, uh, we at the clerk's office like to make sure that people have access to things for um, for the digital records. And I'm gonna walk through four um, websites I think are gonna help you as interns um, provide information to constituents in the future and just educate yourself. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, what you'll be able to see from the clerk site is legislative information at that top panel. You'll be able to see member information, committee information, disclosures, and more information about the clerk. From the legislative information tab, um, you will be able to go and find the votes there and um, discharge petitions and the, the um, basically the calendar of the House. And from there, you'll also be able to see the House floor proceedings. So what you're seeing right now on your screen are some of the floor proceedings from the floor proceedings from the the seventh, and so it, what it's going to show is the day that we were in session. You also see from the home screen the um, number of days that we are in session, um, the number of votes, and the introduced measures, and the measures passed. This is a great resource because sometimes people need to know right off the top what's happening, and um, you can basically get back to your constituents if they ask you those type of questions. Sometimes people want to know, they want to weigh how much activity has been happening in the House. So then you can say, hey, well, you know, in the House, 5,000 measures plus have been introduced and so on. And then you can talk about the number of um, measures that have been passed. And sometimes people want to talk about the activity that their members took place with. So you can use that as a resource there. So uh, one of the things that I want to share with you today is um, the slide on live.house.gov, which is a resource that you can get to from congress.gov. Um, in that slide, the, first, the slide there, the one before this one, um, is how it's set up is you can go straight to see the floor footage as it's going through, or you can go search the caption text or the schedule, which is gonna take you to docs.house.gov, which is uh, the resource that I'm gonna talk about next. And you can also search for some of the legislative actions. Um, so live.house.gov live provides access to current video footage of the floor. And you can also find some archival footage back to 2017. Um, so you can search the closed caption text, um, and then you can find some information. We're gonna just, I'm gonna show you that on the next slide. So the next slide. So if you're looking for a particular member, um, you can find what your member said by doing a member search. And then you can go to, or you can go to the calendar and search by date. So there's a couple of different features there that make it a little bit more interactive for you. Um, and then when you find your particular bit of information, you can use that in the floor clips, which is a next tool that I want to share with you. So for floorclips.house.gov is a resource that's available to you um, to clip floor footage. Sometimes people, sometimes interns especially have been tasked with providing um, the footage for their members one minute speech and they need to post it on their site or make it available during an event that they're doing. Um, and so what you can do is find where your member spoke from the live.house.gov and then you can go to floor clips and have that specific day and do the research and download the footage. So then you basically would do your, your clip there and then you would be able to provide that on, on the uh, site. And then uh, lastly, I wanna talk about docs.house.gov. 
So docs.house.gov is a really viable resource. Um, from there, you can go to find what's happening on that legislative week. So you can, uh, in this example, you can see what happened August uh, the 23rd, and you see the first piece of legislation they have there is uh, Representative Lewis. Um, and then the, um, the one thing that I want to also point out, while a lot of these resources that we saw on clerk.house.gov and um, floor clips and uh, live.house.gov are coming from resources that are built in from the clerk's office. So the clerk has uh, about nine divisions and a lot of staff put together to collectively make these resources available through the actions of their job. Um, this is also in collaboration, this site docs.house.gov is in collaboration with the majority leader's office. So the information that we're seeing from bills to be considered, which is a section of that site comes from the majority leader's office. Um, so they'll update with the text of bills that will be considered. So that's another resource that you can use when you're trying to see what the current um, body of that legislation looks like. Um, and then another site there, which is also on docs.house.gov, is the committee repository. And that's uh, near and dear to my heart because um, I work on training uh, new staffers that are working as committee clerks. Um, so if your path takes you down the road of working on a committee, um, I probably might be one of the persons training you directly on how to use this resource. So uh, a lot of the times, what people will do is they will. Um, become a committee clerk and then they'll start working with the committee repository and um, what you do with the, the committee repository is a central repository for uploading committee documents including meeting notices the truth and testimony forum and text of legislation um, to be considered by the committees on other matters um, and so what you're seeing there is a calendar so if you went onto docs.house.gov and into the committee repository you would be able to see the um, calendar of from the committees and you can also link to the from there and kind of better what's going to happen from the committee so um thank you and that's it for for my bit of information I'm and introducing barbara <laughs> from, hi, from the library of congress thank you so much Venice. um hi i'm barbara bavis i'm the bibliographic and research instruction librarian from the law library of congress but don't worry, I'm not gonna ever make you repeat that again. So I wanna share my screen and talk a little bit about congress.gov. Um, so for those of you who might not have heard of congress.gov before, uh, congress.gov is the official legislative information system um, for Congress. And it includes a wealth of information, which I'm gonna get into in just a moment. Um, it is a joint uh, program with the House Clerk's Office, uh, the Senate Secretary's Office, uh, GPO, the Congressional Research Service, and um, CBO. And so you'll see a lot of information um, from those different parties on uh, congress.gov. So I wanna talk a little bit about what you can find here. Um, and instead of giving you kind of the list of information, what I wanna do is show you kind of how you can see uh, what our content is and how frequently it's updated. So what I'm gonna do is come over here and hopefully um, everyone can see me um, uh, or my screen. And I'm gonna come over here to support. And then you'll notice uh, you can search the Help Center here uh, or you can browse the Help Center. I'm gonna browse in just a moment um, and talk about some of the information we have on congress.gov. But before I do that, I wanna note here on the support screen, you also can use the Congressional Glossary. So if you're unfamiliar with some of those legislative terms um, that you might hear bantered around, uh, you can click the glossary and, and look those items up. But I'm gonna browse the Help Center all right. And in fact, uh, let me scroll down just a little bit. You can see that we do have kind of a quick start guide um, to get you oriented on congress.gov, but I want to focus on the collections, particularly, let me scroll, uh, coverage dates for congress.gov collections. You'll see here um, the listing of some of our information. I want to just give you a quick overview. We have um, bills and resolutions. Um, we've actually been going back in time and doing historical bills. Uh, so right now we have like in the last couple months, 
updated so that we have bills, bill text from 1799 to 1873. And then again from 1989 to the present. And you can see that uh, is listed here as well. Um, we also have information about uh, the session laws or the statutes at large um, from 1951 to the present. And if we scroll down a little bit here, you'll also see that we've added some committee information as well. We have selected committee hearing information from about 2001 to the present. Um, and we have selected committee reports from about 1995 to the present. Scrolling down a little bit further, um, if you're interested in the congressional record or the debates of Congress, what's set on the floor, what's entered into the record, voting information, um, you'll find that we have the congressional record. It says 1921, but we actually just had an update and now it goes back to 1917. Um, so you'll be able to find congressional record pages from 1917 to the present. And then again, if you're interested in information about um, executive nominations, about treaties, uh, we also have that information, as well as member profile pages. Uh, that goes back to 1973. And each member kind of gets their own landing page where there's information about the member, how to contact them, and also a listing of bills and resolutions that they have sponsored or co-sponsored uh, going back to 1973. Uh, I want to get back to our homepage. Oops, let me scroll up uh, to, to the homepage of congress.gov because I want to point out a couple different things here. First, there is going to be a different, a little bit of a difference between the congressional version of congress.gov and the public version of congress.gov. But I don't want to get hung up on that because the differences are, are not quite um, as striking as you might think. A lot of the things that you're going to see here on congress.gov are available to the public. You can copy and paste um, the, uh, the address that you see in the address bar uh, and send to people. But um, if you are on the Hill or uh, in an office or you're using a congressional um, tablet or computer, uh, you might see a little congressional dome. I don't actually have the congressional version up right now, but you might see a little congressional dome over here on the side of your screen. Um, the two main differences that I like to point out um, are one, that you will get access to congressional research service pages, so crs.gov, and two, you'll get access to some subscription resources like Congressional Quarterly. So if you do see a congressional dome, that just means that's on the congressional version of the page. Otherwise, everything you see here is available to the public. Um, scrolling down just a little bit, I want to note um, that you can see links to uh, CRS reports, Congressional Research Service reports, and the Constitution annotated. Um, you'll have access to CRS reports uh, and the CRS.gov website, but if you would like to send uh, CRS report material um, to your constituents, all you have to do is click search CRS reports, and then you can enter in your keyword of interest here. I'm just going to choose one that um, I got asked about recently, which was environment. If I could spell it correctly, that'd be great. And then it'll just bring up all the Congressional Research Service reports that have that keyword, and you'll also be able to limit by content type and date. Um, going back to the home page, I also want to show you the Constitution annotated. Uh, if you're dealing with any kind, and I'm going to open it in a new tab, um, if you're dealing with any kind of constitutional uh, law issues, um, the Constitution annotated is a great resource for that. It's done by the Congressional Research Service, and they are a collection of essays that actually go over the history of different articles of the Constitution and amendments, and then also um, explain how federal courts have interpreted uh, those articles and those amendments over the years. And they actually cite you to the primary source material that you can look at. So if there is a case cited, we'll actually link you to that Supreme Court opinion, for example. All right, and let me know if there's any questions. I'm more than happy to, to help. Um, I'm going to go back to congress.gov's homepage. Um, and I want to just show you there is a simple Google like search box at the top of congress.gov. Um, all you have to do if you want to narrow down what you're searching 
is use the drop down menu and select the source you'd like to use. It's going to default to the current Congress, so just be sure if you're doing a more historical search to change that drop down menu. You also have the option to use the legislative quick search, which is a little bit more of an advanced search. And then you also at the top of the screen can link to advanced searches, so even more advanced searches. Um, coming over to, we're still at the top of the congress.gov page. Uh, if you're interested in more committee information, we do have a committees link here um, where it actually links you to the different committees, what bills they're considering, and also information about video streams of committee hearings. So we, we do link to the, the House uh, page as well. So thanks, Benice, for mentioning that. Um, we always get questions about hearings, so I wanted to be sure to touch on that. And then also, um, if you're interested in member information, so those member profile pages I talked about before, you can always click on the members link at the top of the page and get to those member pages there. Um, before I turn it over, I just wanna note one more thing. If you scroll down to the bottom of any congress.gov page, and sorry, I hope I'm not uh, throwing you for a loop there, you'll notice there's a contact us link please feel free to click that contact us link and you can um, submit and ask a law librarian question to us. We're more than happy to help. You can also send uh, your constituents to us if they're having any issues with congress.gov or wanna ask us questions about a bill. All right, and I'm gonna stop sharing now and um, turn it over to uh, Monica St. Dennis, who's a reference librarian at the House of Representatives Library. So like Barbara said, I am Monica St. Dennis, and I am a reference librarian at the House Library. And I also am going to just take a moment to straighten. Um, yeah, so like I said, I'm a reference librarian at the House Library. So the House Library is uh, an office under the office of the clerk of the House. Right? So earlier, Venice mentioned that there are a lot of different offices that make up the office of the clerk and work together to comp compile information. We are one of those offices. We actually don't have anything to do the Library of Congress. Uh, we founded a little bit before they were, but since then, they have expanded in a broader scope than we have. Uh, our entire function is to support the House of Representatives. So we're not open to the public. We don't have anything to do with the Senate. We are only for uh, House staffers and House offices. Now, we do maintain a collection of House publications going back to the first Congress. We have print copies of that. Uh, main reason people interact with us is for research help. So we provide reference and research services uh, nine to five during extended research and nine to six the rest of the time. So you can get hold of us at 202-259-9000 or by email at library at mail.house.gov. Normally I would say you can also drop by our office. We're at 292 in the campus building, but right now we are not still at work because of the uh, coronavirus, right? Like a lot of other people are. So probably by telephone or email is the best way to reach us right now. If you are doing research and come on a roadblock or have questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. That is what we're for. We often hear people don't want to call us because they're worried about interrupting us or their question is not uh, it's not a big enough question to be worth our time. That's not the case. We are here to help you answer questions about that. Um, like I said, the best way to access our resources right now is virtually. Now, we do have a website. The URL is library.house.gov, and that is a house-specific website. Uh, so you'll need to be either in your office or on a uh, computer or tablet connected to the house network to get to it. But you can go there to find information about how to research legislation, committees, members. Um, we also have quite extensive databases that we provide access to. Uh, so what I'm going to do with the remainder of my time is talk a little bit about our four most popular databases, which are the things that uh, most people who are new to Congress uh, have the most questions about and find the most useful right off the bat. Uh, so first, I want to show you or I want to highlight um, a database called ProQuest Congressional. This is a collection of documents related to Congress uh, going all the way back to the first Congress. Uh, it is something that you need to have a paid subscription to access. So you also won't be able to access it unless you are on the House network, but the House Library does provide access uh, to everybody in the House Library. You won't be able to send this to your constituents, but you can use it to yourself and to your colleagues. 
uh, anything like that. And they, I think they, ProQuest Congressional is the resource we usually recommend for people doing historical research. Like I said, they have uh, documents, legislation going back to the first Congress. They have uh, hearing transcripts going back to 1824. Right? So any kind of historical research you want to get progress congressional and like i said uh you can get there from the house library website one second monica i'm gonna interrupt you for one second your sound is a little bit choppy okay like you're bumping into your microphone um could you just move back from it a little bit okay uh perfect tell me if that's any better that's a lot better thanks so much all right um okay so the next database I want to highlight is Legislative Insight. This is uh, produced by the same people who make ProQuest Congressional. It is a collection of information about legislation that has been signed into law, right? So you'll hear people um, talk about legislative histories, which is the collection of documents associated with a law. This is one of the uh, easiest places to find those. So if you come to this database, again, from the House Library website and um, search for a particular law that's been passed. You can get all of the publications that went into it uh, gathered into one location here. So that's our next resource. Uh, now the next one, next database I want to highlight, I don't want to spend too much time on because Barbara already covered it in much, much more detail than I uh, am able to, but we are a help desk for Congress.gov. So um, like Barbara said at the beginning, if you on the support tab at the top of congress.gov. You'll find our phone number there. You can call us to help you with questions about that. Um, if you don't, for some reason, want to contact the Library of Congress, we also can help. Uh, and then the last resource I'd like to point out is we provide access to a GIS software called HouseMap. It is linked to um, ArcGIS. And GIS, in case you don't know, stands for Geographic Information System. It is a way of uh, overlaying information onto a map to help you visualize what's happening. So for example, what most congressional offices or most uh, member offices, at least committees have other reasons, but or most member offices seem to use it to track constituent correspondence. So if you're getting a lot of calls uh, from, or from your constituents on a particular topic, you can put their addresses or zip codes or whatever on the map uh, and kind of see which parts of your district are impacted the most by uh, whatever issue it is that they're calling about. Right. So we do provide access to that as well. Now, in case you want to know how to use these things and are a little unsure where to start, uh, I want to point out we do teach classes. So we teach uh, four classes on a monthly basis uh, just with the House Library. And then there's one other class we teach uh, in collaboration with CRS, the Congressional Research Service. So the four classes the library teaches are one called House Research Tools, and that uh, will teach you the process a bill goes through to become a law and what databases to use to find more information about the different types of publications that are created during that process. Um, there's a class on introduction to congress.gov. There's a class called legislative research with ProQuest Congressional, which uh, goes over how to use ProQuest Congressional in quite a lot of detail. Uh, and then we have a class on how to use House Act, right? So most of our, our most popular resources, we have classes to teach you how to use them that are offered on a monthly basis. Uh, we also, about once a month, co-teach a class on congress.gov with the Congressional Research Service, uh, which tends to have a bit more of the uh, changes to the site or updates from the site, uh, than just a regular introduction. So if you're interested in those things, um, again, you can get that information on the House Library website. They're all offered once a month. House Research Tools is already gone for September, but the others are all still coming up. So um, you'll have that view. Now, again, I want to say, in case you missed it the first time, um, we have uh, you can contact us at the House Library. We're here 9 to 5 or 6, uh, Monday through Friday, and we are standing by to help you with your research. So hi, everyone. This is Daniel Schumann. So I'm Policy Director at Demand Progress, and um, you've heard from three excellent experts uh, on tools that are largely available uh, uh, for folks who are on the Hill, although of course Congress.gov uh, and the Clerk's website are also have many tools that are available to the public as well. Well, there are a number of other tools uh, if you get calls from constituents or if you're doing research or even if you just sort of Google things um, that will come up um, in terms of questions that you might run into or, or efforts to, 
to understand what's happening in the legislative context. And I just wanted to step you through a couple of them um, uh, because I think that you'll find them helpful. One of them, uh, there is a civil society analog to congress.gov, which is govtrap.us. Uh, it's a website built by Josh, Dr. Josh Tauber starting in 2004. And uh, it has roughly similar traffic to congress.gov, um, has uh, similar information, although it has, a, I think, a bit more, um, well, so, so, some additional bells and whistles. And it's uh, more designed around the concept of like constituents communicating with Congress um, than, um, than um, uh, other, other purposes, although there's a ton of legislative information is here as well. Uh, so when you look through Cong uh, GovTrack, uh, for example, you can find any bill, from, any law from 1789 to present. Uh, this is a way that constituents will often try to find who their members uh, are, they put in their addresses here or find legislation that they care about. You can get, of course, legislative alerts. Um, you can look up press releases released by individual members of Congress for their legislative records. Um, this also has a side-by-side -side feature, so you can actually compare two different bills or two different versions of the same bill to see what's changed. This is a tool that the, the clerk of the house has been building um, and it's rolled out to some folks, but this, is, this has been available from GovTrack for a little while. Uh, it's not quite as clever as the tool that the clerk will be rolling out, um, but this is, this is available to everybody now, including the public, so they can compare versions of bills. Uh, it also has great tools to help identify potential co-sponsors, uh, and there are legislative report cards on members of Congress, so you can look up your particular member uh, or other members, and you can see how people have voted. Um, uh, and if you look at the menu bar sort of at the top of GovTrack, um, there is a lot of information for congressional staff, which is you, uh, that talks about the tools and resources that are available to them, including the legislative uh, report cards, uh, backgrounds in congressional procedural rules and norms, trackers, and so on and so forth. So this is, a, this is a great resource for you. Another resource that's available uh, is the website everycrsreport.com. Uh, it's something that we built. Um, in the last couple of years, the Library of Congress has begun publishing CRS reports online. These are Congressional Research Service reports. Uh, by way of background, I used to work at CRS as a legislative attorney there, so I have a, a particular love for this, this content. Um, there are a little, little bit fewer than 10,000 reports available on CRS's official website, but um, at every CRS report, we have somewhere in the vicinity of 19,000 reports, a little bit more of an intuitive search tool, um, and uh, a couple more bells and whistles. You can download the, download the files as a PDF. You can download it as an EPUB to read on your Kindle. You can see how the different versions of it have changed. Uh, so this is, this is something that when constituents are looking for older CRS reports or current ones, uh, this is a great place to go. And often when you Google around looking for CRS reports, um, CRS itself will take its older reports off its internal website, um, but we keep all of the reports up here. So you might be able to find a little bit more. Um, the next tool I wanted to mention is something that is an alpha. So this is something that we're developing, but it's not done yet. It's called Bill Map. Uh, GovTrack is commonly hosting this, all this is something that Demand Progress has been working on. And as a staffer, um, it's often hard to understand where legislation has come from or finding companion measures. So the same idea that sort of exists elsewhere. So what we've done is we built a tool that allows you to see related bills in the same Congress. So bills that are similar to the bill that you're looking at, in this case, the Access to Commercial Mandate Reports Act. Uh, we highlight relevant sponsors that are in positions on relevant committees of jurisdiction. And if you scroll down, I'm going to do this quickly because there's a lot of material here. You can see, uh, oops, sorry, I went too far. You can see the history of this legislation. So you can see here's this bill in the 117th. Here it is in the 116th. Um, and you can go back further in time as well, which is really sort of a useful tool. So you can see where concepts come from. You can also see, for example, if there's a relevant CRS report, we connect that information to you or if it's a CBO score or committee documents or press statements. These are all the press statements that mention this legislation and sort of and so on and so forth. Um, I don't think there's an SAP on this one, but anyway. Uh, so it doesn't work quite right. It mostly works. It's a good way to sort of start as you're looking around trying to figure out what's going on. One tool that may just save you a little bit of time. So often when you go and you get legislation drafted through, like, through the Office of um, Legislative Council to give it to you as a PDF file. And this website builds a text, we'll turn it from a PDF into a text file, 
so that you can actually share it with folks and get comments and things like that. And the final thing that I want to orient you to is that we have a weekly newsletter called the First Branch Forecast that looks into how Congress itself is operating and focused on legislative transparency. And the reason why you might care is we often talk about the development of new tools either inside Congress, uh, whether it's the bill comparison project or efforts to make earlier laws publicly available, but we also talk about other things as well in terms of uh, technological development from civil society. Thank you, Daniel, for um, that presentation. Um, we are super thrilled to have had all of you and these substantive, really thorough um, jumps into Congress. I'm curious to hear more about the constituent questions. So what do constituents ask about? Do they ask their members about bills, CRS reports, any common questions that constituents will ask related to this material? And this is for any of the panelists if you wanna jump in. Back with the Office of the Clerk. So in my experience, um, when we get questions uh, relate, and, and Monica could, po could probably also help with this question from the um, House Library, but when we get questions uh, related to what's going on in legislation, people want to know what's going on with current hot topic legislation, um, and they they really want to have a, a an, an idea of what their member is doing. They want to know like how they voted. So that's why I was trying to show that roll call vote. They um, want to know how they voted so we can direct them to that resource on, on clerk.house.gov. Um, and they want to know, sometimes they want to know even demographics of the house, like, you know, who, who, who are the active members? What are they doing? So there's also a lot of member information that's available on clerk.house.gov. Um, you've all been working in this area for quite a while, I'd love to know what types of innovations or what's been the biggest change that you've seen you know, in this field happen over the course of your careers. I think there has been tremendous innovation um, in the clerk's office in particular, also at the Library of Congress. There used to be a very old uh, website called Thomas that was before Congress.gov that was, that was good at the time that it was developed and then became out of date and Congress.gov has continued to innovate in a way that is phenomenal. Uh, the clerk's office has, been, has done tremendous work as well. Uh, there's several new tools that they've got coming out. They built a great phone book recently. Um, we have seen in the last decade um, docs.house.gov, which is a tremendous resource for information about what's happening in committees and happening on the floor. One website that we didn't talk about as much um, uh, is the floor side of docs.house.gov, although it was mentioned a bit, where you can see all the amendments that are being offered for four bills before they're considered, um, which is which is which is you know super helpful. And of course, the the clerk's uh, page around being able to have contextual information around what's happening on the floor is great. Outside of sort of official channels, um, a lot of the innovations that you're seeing in the in inside also are happening usually a year or two previously on the outside and they help to, they help to um, provide an illustration of what's possible and then the folks inside come and build like phenomenal versions of it and, and bring it to you know, uh, um, uh, higher levels than, than what necessarily had been imagined. Um, so, you, so you do see a lot of, a lot more recently efforts to provide context. So this bill is connected to the CRS reports, it's connected to the CBO score, which is connected to this witness testimony. And, and you're starting to get um, information, not just available through different silos, but available in context. And what that's starting to do is to make it, you know, being a staffer and like I start, like I don't go back as far as Brad does. I've, I was an intern 20 years ago, uh, 20 years ago next week, I think actually. Um, being able to figure out what's happened before you got there is very hard. And we're seeing more and more efforts to make it possible to understand what's happened previously so that you can understand the legislative and political context. So that, that, at least from where I sit, uh, those are really the major innovations that we've seen. Uh, yeah, and I'd like, I'd like to agree with Daniel there. I think the interconnectedness of the information um, is what I found to be extremely helpful because when I have someone, you know, calling me at the reference desk and they want to figure out everything there is to know about a certain bill, it's nice to be able to send them um, to something like, you know, congress.gov or GovTrack um, and, you know, show them, you know, here's where you can find the committee information, here's where you can find, you know, the um, congressional record information all kind of in, in one place. And, and also, um, listening to feedback. Um, there's 
been ever more increasing listening to feedback, which we want, you know, <laughs> to reach out um, to you guys and to the public um, and make sure that we're giving you something that is helpful. Thank you, Brad, Denise, Barbara, Monica, and Daniel for your insights today. Um, one of the perks of the Congressional Internship is the access to the incredible resources available only in Congress, and this is a fantastic introduction for our intern.